Welcome to Wake the Herd. I'm your host, Doug Warren. Our guest today is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and a former Marine Corps infantry officer. He served from 1984 to 1987. He is the author of eight novels and is working on his ninth novel as we speak. Some of those previous novels include Darkness Under Heaven, The Enemy Inside, Threat Level, The Blood We Shed, Mercy Mission, and Warriors of God. And his honesty and candor in talking about all things in regards to the U.S. military is something very much appreciated by me. I'd like to welcome William Christie to the program. Welcome, Bill. Thank you, Doug. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I um, wanted to begin uh, by talking to you about um, what is going on with regards to the war on terror and, and how that is expanding. Uh, I'm I'm sure, you know, you being a, a military officer yourself, <laughs> you've probably had numerous conversations about uh, the 1961 farewell address by Dwight Eisenhower, um, where he warned about the uh, potential dangers of the, mis uh, the military-industrial complex. Um, to me, and we talked about this the other day, to me it seems that almost we're at the point now where... Uh, the United States doesn't necessarily have a national defense, but an international offense. I wonder what your thoughts were on that. Well, we, we don't have a, an international defense because uh, we really have no serious enemies. Right. I mean, it, it makes it very easy to, uh, to be offensively minded and interventionist if you really have uh, a huge military and no serious enemies. And when I mean no serious enemies, I mean Al-Qaeda uh, specifically. Um, you know, we've spent literally billions of dollars trying to secure airline travel, the borders, uh, everything else. Uh, the various attacks that they've made on us uh, have been mainly foiled either by mistake or good luck on our part or total incompetence on their part. Uh, you know, if you look at it as a, a risk management uh, situation, which any any company, uh, any law enforcement agency would uh, would do, we lost 5,000 Americans or so in the 9/11 attacks, and I'm not minimizing that tragedy at all. Um, but we lose 50,000 Americans on the roads every year. I mean, we'll lose we'll lose more Americans in the next month and a half uh, just driving on our highways than we lost on 9/11 totally. And uh, and I say this as someone who's uh, who's f several friends of mine were in the Pentagon on 9/11, so uh, I'm not being flippant about that at all. But we're patting down six-year-olds that are flying on airplanes and spending enormous amounts of money. Uh, to basically mitigate a threat that's quite minimal. Why, <clears throat> why, why is this happening? Uh, why, why does our government continue to to tout this as you describe it a minimal threat uh, and and play it up like uh, you know it's the Cold War all over again, or, or you know even saying that uh, this is a. I remember at the start of all this. Uh, folks were saying this could be a century-long conflict and this is going to take a long time to they were just building it up like the like the biggest war that we've had since World War II and I just wondered you know what your thoughts were on why they did that well 9-11 was a massive shock it was a massive shock to Americans um, Americans took it as seriously as the previous generation of Americans took Pearl Harbor but the existential threat to America was not the same uh, and Americans, you know, our, our present difficulties in Libya uh, sort of illustrate the fact that Americans, whether they're in the Washington establishment or whether they're in Main Street America, USA, uh, tend to sort of re react in a knee-jerk, my God, we have to do something manner to, uh, to international affairs. <laughs> Yeah, it, uh, it seems whenever we do have a problem, we uh, whether it be domestic or foreign, we always declare war on it. Well, it's, it's really the same thing uh, if you went to a cardiologist uh, with a medical problem that turned out not to be about your heart. 
the cardiologist would be at sea, basically, because cardiologists do hearts, and that's all they do. So it's the old expression that uh, if the only tool that you have is a hammer, then every problem becomes a nail. <laughs> right. Um. So we have a huge military establishment, and we've gotten used to using it. And on the left, you have the neoconservative. I mean, excuse me, on the right, you have uh, the neoconservatives in the national security establishment that feel that we need to go remake the international order overseas. And on the other side, we have the liberal interventionists that mean that feel that we have to go intervene to make the world a better place. Uh, and because of that, uh, uh, we tend to do it. And we have an all-volunteer military, so you're not having a situation where everyone is getting drafted and draftees are being sent overseas to die. Uh, you've sort of got a self-selecting part of the population that's bearing the burden of, uh, of our, uh, our military uh, operations overseas. And that potentially has its own problems in that regard, doesn't it? Well, we're wearing it out. Yeah. Uh, we, have, uh, we don't have a huge military. We have a large military. But uh, the burden is, fall is fallen on a disproportionately small section of the U.S. military, in particular the infantry combat arms of the Army and the, uh, and the Marine Corps. And uh, they're either, it's become sort of a rotating force where they're doing one hitch, they're getting out, and the ones that are staying in are basically being worked to death. Uh, I mean, there are some senior NCOs in the, uh, I mean, non-commissioned officers, uh, the, the sergeant and above ranks in the military, which is really the corporate knowledge of the military, the people that hold the military together and get things done on a daily basis. Uh, they've, uh, they've been in now since uh, they were 18 years old, and they're 28 and 29, and they're staff sergeants and sergeant first class in the Army, uh, and they may have done six or seven tours, either in Iraq or Afghanistan. And, uh, and they're worn out. They're definitely worn out. And the burden on their families and their marriages and everything else is, uh, is extraordinary. And uh, other than their immediate families and friends, uh, most Americans, uh, other than the knee-jerk support for the troops, don't really care. Right. I, um, and there's never, and I'm, I'm assuming... Uh, and you would know this much better than me, there's never been a conflict in American history that has asked enlisted men or, or non-commissioned officers to do six or seven tours, as you say. That's never happened before, correct? No, I mean, there were, uh, uh, there were certain units in World War II that were overseas from, say, 19, uh, 1942, 1943 to 1945, and saw periods of intensive combat for a year or more, but uh, nothing, uh, nothing like what, uh, like what's happened in the past 10 years. Yeah. Have you, um, during this time, uh, ever been to Walter Reed or another uh, hospital of that, of that size, that magnitude, that, that treats that many? Uh... Well, I've been to the Wounded Warrior Barracks at, uh, at Camp Lejeune. North Carolina, which okay. is the Marine Corps base there, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a uh, it's a sobering uh, it's a sobering experience. Uh, when I was in the Marine Corps in uh, 1984 to 1987, uh, there were senior enlisted men and uh, lieutenant colonels who were Vietnam veterans, uh, and other than that, uh, it was uh, it was a peacetime military. Uh, today, if you go to Camp Lejeune. And look around. There's a Purple Heart and a Combat Action Ribbon on uh, on the chest of, uh, of practically every Marine you run into. Right. Yeah, and then for somebody like yourself who's been in and out of this and, and around this, you know, your whole adult life, that like you say, it does have to be pretty sobering to see this. <clears throat> um, what What is in particular because in this war. Even more so than Vietnam, which was a mine and booby trap war, uh, 
the use of improvised explosive devices in both Iraq and Afghanistan are leaving troops with horrific injuries. And unlike other wars, the med medical care has improved to the point where they're surviving these horrific injuries, which they did not in previous wars. And uh, it's uh, uh, the, the injuries are nearly catastrophic. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's a generation that uh, the we are going to have to uh, we're going to have to take care of, and based upon uh, the way Americans have taken care of their veterans in past wars, we probably won't. Yeah, it, uh, that's a good point. It, it it seems that, and to me, you know, I, I I'm not a military veteran. I I never have been, but it seems to me, and and. Sometimes this is brought up by the media, but certainly not, and it certainly won't be this week because we're going to hear about all, you know, the the royal wedding and other distract attacks all week. That's what I described. Well, today is <laughs> today is April twenty fifth, and April twenty fifth is Anzac Day. Yeah. And if you are in Australia and New Zealand, uh, there'll be a moment of silence, and there'll be parades, and uh, and they will remember the uh, the landing at Gallipoli in uh, in World War One. And they still take this date uh, very, very seriously. Yeah, whereas but, our Veterans Day is basically another day off for. Uh, it's uh, it's an excuse to barbecue. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's uh, that's basically what what we do. Do you ever talk about that that type of why things have evolved that way with with the people that you know? I you you. Well, uh, it's always been that way. I mean, I have I have <clears throat> friends that uh, long time friends that are still in the military and still in the national security establishment, and those that were in the military still are in government service and uh, a number of other jobs. And America, other than that, the post-World War II period where uh, being a veteran was a universal thing, that virtually everyone had gone in the military, and because of that, uh, veterans' benefits were uh, a priority in the post-war period. Uh, other than that, American America has been has honored veterans in the breach, but not the observance. Uh, it was always soldiers and dogs stay off the grass. It was the uh, the bonus army after World War One during the Depression, you know, marching on Washington to get the uh, the veterans bonuses that they they promised, and uh, ended up being tear gassed and. Uh, and run out of town by uh, by the uh, the administration and uh, General Douglas MacArthur. Right, right. Um, and of course, the way we treated the Vietnam generation is uh, is something that Americans. I think the 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 reflexive support for the troops that we have these days, uh, which is just a matter of talk and putting a bumper sticker on your car and everything like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's 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 sniffed at by the troops. I mean, they appreciate it, but they don't take it very seriously because they know what it costs to go to war, and they know what it costs to put a bumper sticker on your car, and it's not uh, the same thing by any stretch of the imagination. Right. Is, do you sense, uh, uh, maybe it, it's kind of always been there the last, especially maybe the last four or five years, but an animosity from your colleagues in the military uh, towards the civilian leadership, whether it be you know the last two presidents in the White House or uh, you know, even uh, the politicians on Capitol Hill, where it's a lot of lip service, but there's not really a lot being done? Well, the military always feels that way about politicians. Yeah. I mean, it's always been the case. It was the case back when, uh, when, I was, uh, when I was a young lieutenant back in the early 1980s, and at the time that I was in, there was a lot of post-Vietnam backlash against the military that was still present, and uh, we didn't wear our uniforms out in public. We made sure we were in civilian clothes, and uh, if you uh, if you went to a club sometimes, uh, you know, with your military haircut, uh, no one would want to talk to you. Uh, you know, that was uh, that's not so far in the past, and that's also at the time when. Uh, most of the generals today were lieutenants back then. Uh, most of the senior enlisted men today were young troops back then, and they still remember that. 
and of course the military has always been separate. It's a, it's it's been a Spartan separateness, especially with the all volunteer force from the rest of American society. Especially now, when the military looks upon themselves as making all the sacrifices, and uh, and America isn't. I mean, the the statement, uh, you know, we go to war and you go shopping. Uh, it, you hear that a lot. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and that's it's a pretty a pretty blunt way of putting it, but it's the truth. Well, the military is always blunt about these things. Yeah, I mean, no, there's, I... <laughs> that, there, there's there's that that vein of uh, of kind of cynical. <laughs> Cynical, realistic humor about uh, about the ways of the world, and uh, uh, most military officers don't like serving in Washington, and don't like uh, other than the ver- the most ambitious, they don't like being around politicians uh, because they know that everybody wants to get their picture taken with someone in uniform. But when it comes to push to shove, uh, you know you're going to. They really don't care if the weapons work, and they don't care uh, whether it's a smart war they're sending you to. But you know, none of this is the military's idea. The military goes where they're told to go. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes the senior leadership, uh, in, in view of the junior leadership, feels that the senior leadership doesn't give politicians the best advice that they could. Um, Why you know, is that? That's a, well, that's a. Well, the 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 junior the, the the junior ranks feel that the senior ranks of generals are more politicians than generals anyway. That mm-hmm. That's how you become a general. That you're more politician than uh, than military man, and they kind of look at them as sort of uh, domesticated house cats that are uh, you know don't want to make a lot of waves and uh, don't want to take a lot of risks and you know certainly don't want to stand up to. Uh, the senior political leadership and say, you know, that's not a good idea. Um, you know, and that's that hasn't happened. Till, you know, that's not a recent phenomenon. Sure. It was the same thing when we were, uh, when Lyndon Johnson was thinking about going to Vietnam. There was no member of the Joint Chiefs of Staff that took the stars off their collar and put it on the table and said, this is a bad idea. Uh, we don't want to do this. Uh, in really recently, the last 50 years, the only time that ever happened was when Eisenhower was contemplating getting involved in uh, what was then Indochina, later Vietnam, when it looked like the French were not going to be able to hold on there. And there was a lot of pressure for, uh, for military intervention. And General Matthew Ridgway, who was the chief of staff of the Army, um, basically went into Eisenhower and made the argument that uh, this was a bad idea and backed it up with uh, the costs of what it would take uh, to put American troops in, uh, in, in Vietnam. And Eisenhower, as a military man, understood it perfectly, but Ridge, Ridgeway put his career on the line to do that and, uh, and retired shortly afterward. And uh, that sort of history of moral courage is not... Uh, is not uh, very uh, not very prevalent in right. uh, the senior ranks of American generals. But I mean, you really can't, you know, in a way, the you know the the junior officers blame them. But when has you know it's much easier to be a um, it's much easier to be a moral coward than it is to be a physical coward. I mean, you can, you know most uh, most of the generals in the U.S. military would charge a machine gun, but putting their career and their retirement and everything else uh, on the line is uh, it's a uh, it's a hard thing to ask anyone. I mean, how many people and how many jobs uh, you know do that on a daily basis anyway, with uh, with a course of action they think is going to be disastrous? It's like, well, it's not my call. You know, the boss wants to do this. You know, it's gonna it's not going to work, but you know, yeah, let yeah. him do it. Yeah, everybody. There's people everywhere that have to deal with that every day. It's, sure. it's not on the, the level of the military, but yeah. Well, the stakes are higher. Long, the stakes right. are higher, but for you personally, you know, if uh, you know, there, there's there's barely a general in the U.S. military whose kids aren't going to college, and uh, they have the same uh, they have the same considerations as every American has. And, right. Uh, you know, nobody is anxious to uh, to put it on the table and walk out the door. Uh, the the recent example of General Shinseki, who was the chief of staff of the army when uh, uh, the Bush administration was contemplating going into Iraq, and he very bluntly uh, laid down what it was going to take and what the costs and uh, the pros and cons were, and 
the next day, even though he had two, he had over a year left on his tour as the chief of staff of the army. Donald Rumsfeld announced his replacement the next day, uh-huh. and he basically, uh, you know, got put on a rail and ridden out of town. Right. And uh, to this day, he hasn't uh, he hasn't uh, really talked about uh, that. He hasn't written his memoirs yet. It'll be very interesting when he does. Uh, but the example to uh, to everyone else in the military, it was pretty clear. Right. You know, you uh, if you if you're in the habit of shooting the messenger who gives you bad news, then don't be surprised if a lot of messengers don't turn up, and they're not all that eager when they do. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, I was going to bring Shinseki, Shinseki up, but I'm glad you did. Uh, to me, it seems that by continuing on this course, where uh, <laughs> it's it's I don't know in a lot of ways it's like Vietnam all over again with the war on terror where we're in Afghanistan and in Iraq and these are places that you know really empires have gone to to, to die so to speak over the course of uh, you know thousands of years of history um, sooner or later the uh, there's going to be some blowback from this not 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 from foreign and uh, foreign uh, people but from the military itself it just seems to me that sooner or later these guys that are being asked to go do the impossible are going to say we're not going to do it anymore do you, do you see that ever happening well it's 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 a complicated question uh the u.s military is at present hemorrhaging junior officers they're signing up they're going to war they're doing their four years and they're leaving uh, the Army is short of uh, captains. They're short of majors. Uh, until recently, virtually everyone who was eligible for promotion to those ranks was picked, whether they were any good or not, simply because the, the numbers weren't there. Um, uh, so, you know, that's a, and that's a big concern in the senior ranks of the military, that the, the, the seed corn, because uh, you have to have lieutenants and you know, lieutenants are going to be generals someday, and mm-hmm. if you don't have them staying in, then you're not going to have uh, quality generals. Um, it's a concern. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a bad economy is always the greatest recruitment tool. Um, at the time of the, the height of the Iraq War, the, the bonuses that were being paid for reenlistment uh, in the, the combat arms were awesome. I mean, they were staggering. Uh, at, right now, they're really not offering anything because uh, recruitment is up uh, because the economy is bad. So there's something to be said for uh, recession as far as uh, fully manning the military, I guess. That's sad. <laughs> oh, man. But yeah, it's true though. It you know when when you don't have a job, you gotta you gotta take what you can get, and uh, I don't know it, it, the the. <laughs> To me, it uh, it's it's a sad state of affairs with the way things are going in the in the country, and uh, you know the, the, they call World War II, I guess, the last great war. And I don't. Well, it was the sort of last great war in that it was probably, other than the Civil War, well, even then, you know, as a student of history, it was probably the one of the very few wars in American history that ended unambiguously. It was over. I mean, yes, we rolled into a Cold War as soon as that, but uh, Germany was defeated. Hitler was dead. Tojo was hanged. Uh, uh, that, was, uh, w- w- that was it. It was done. The job was done. Right. Virtually every other war in American history uh, ended ambiguously. I mean, even the Civil War from really 1865 the Civil War lasted until 1965 with the Civil Rights Movement. Yeah. Uh, yeah so, in a lot of ways, yep. so we look at World War II, but it's really kind of an anomaly mm-hmm. as far as American wars go. You know, and general and wars in general. Uh, people that uh, people that conduct wars are always looking for the decisive battle. I mean, even in Afghanistan, we're looking for the decisive battle against the Taliban. And uh, in the history of warfare, it really doesn't happen uh, because the enemy doesn't really offer 
himself up to be destroyed in a decisive battle for the most part. And generally speaking, um, war is ending with the enemy completely bombed to rubble, prostate, and occupied doesn't happen all that either, either because the, the costs, as World War II showed, are extraordinary. Right. What uh, <clears throat> What's your opinion of what we are, uh, along with NATO, are doing right now in Libya? Um, is this just kind of a, an extension of the folly of Iraq and Afghanistan, or is there something different going on here? Well, I think it's a different kind of folly. You know, we always seem to we always seem to fall in a new uh, a folly that's the same kind of folly, but for a new and different reason. Again, it was the my God, we've got to do something. You know, we've got to do something about this situation. And of course, with Gaddafi, uh, what better boogeyman to have? I mean, you know, there's there's no there's really no one in the Western world, at least, that would raise a hand and say Muammar Gaddafi was a guy that was uh, that you ought to leave alone, that you ought to leave in power. Uh, that being said, the law of unintended consequences always takes place every time you do a military intervention, and we're really finding ourselves in a situation where we've intervened not so much in a popular rebellion, but a tribal civil war, where you have the tribes that were for Gaddafi and you have the tribes that are against Gaddafi in Libya and... Uh, they're trying to sort of sort out the uh, sort out the family business, and because neither side is militarily competent enough to defeat the other, you've got a stalemate right now. And of course, any time you have a stalemate, politicians politicians hate stalemates because stalemates drag on into political campaigning cycles. And any time you have a stalemate, the the urge is always that. Well, you know, if we put a couple, if we put a couple of battalions of ground troops in there, you know, we'll get this all straightened out. We or whatever we do, you know, it's the urge is always to to do a little bit more. The military calls it mission creep, and that's why the military usually has to be dragged kicking and screaming into ventures like this. And the U.S. military was definitely grabbed, grabbed kicking and screaming uh, <laughs> right. into going into Libya. They really wanted no part of it at all. But again, when they're told to do something, they salute and they face about and they go out and make it happen. That's uh, that's what the job that's what the job is. Yeah, uh, when you you know Robert Gates said uh, there's not going to be troops on the ground as long as I'm in this office. How long is he going to? Well, he he wasn't he wasn't planning on hanging on that much longer right, anyway. Right. But, uh, uh, and whether and again, whether you are able to find a guy which I doubt, with his particular brand of experience with the military and the national security establishment mm -hmm. and a strong personality uh, that would be able to, to give an opinion like that, I doubt. I doubt. And probably not, anyway, because politicians generally don't like that sort of thing. Right. It was the same thing when Colin... I mean, it's the same thing why when people complain about not getting good advice from the senior military leadership... Uh, when Colin Powell was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he was extraordinarily influential because he knew how the, le the levers of power operated in both the military and the government. He, Because of that, he attracted a lot of power to himself. Uh, and politicians of both administrations, really the, Bush the, the first Bush administration and the Clinton administration, and then the Bush administration, where he was the Secretary of State, didn't really like, they were attracted to, to, the, to him and that power, but they didn't really like it all that much because he was an independent player. After he left as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, um, a whole selection of basically, I'm not going to say incompetent, but uh, pliable non-entities uh, became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff after him and have really continued to the, the present day. Uh, so you generally get what you wish for. I mean, the politicians didn't really want to deal with someone as powerful as him from the military standpoint. And because of that, they picked the people that weren't going to give them a lot of problems. And 
you know, have reaped the rewards of their decisions the way most people reap the rewards of their decisions. Was that one of the reasons why uh, there was so much friction between Rumsfeld and, and Powell during that? Well, of course, cause, yeah. because Powell was totally independent. Yeah. Uh, you know, he was always torn, in my in my view, you know, I don't want to put words in his mouth oh, or, you know, imagine what his, uh, but I think he was always torn between, uh, you know, his independent view of things and being a good subordinate. I mean, I think he viewed himself as the Secretary of State, as the President's subordinate, and he didn't want to undercut the President, but it was also a case where uh, I don't think he... Uh, I don't think he approved of the policy, yet he got tagged along with the policy. Uh, and I think that's the reason why you haven't really heard from him since. Mm-hmm. That uh, I think he's still, he's still bearing the scars of, uh, of having gone along with, uh, with what ended up being, I think everyone can pretty much agree, a, a disastrous decision. Yeah. Uh, now that <clears throat> NATO and... Uh... The United States, at, at, at least at a, a small level at this point, is in is in Libya. Um, do you see that expansion, that mission creep, uh, heading eastward towards Syria and Iran in the coming uh, five years or so? I really don't think so. I think we're looking at the costs of. Uh, I think we're looking at the costs of intervention and uh, and realizing that uh, that you know Syria's. You, to tell you the truth, from a national security standpoint of the U.S., Syria is peripheral. Mm-hmm. Uh, Iran is uh, is the big uh, is the big deal because they're hell bent on developing a nuclear weapon. And from the Iranian standpoint, that's your one guarantee against being invaded by the U.S. is having a nuclear weapon. Uh, and of course, having looked from a, having looked at Iraq and the invasion of Iraq and the downfall of Saddam Hussein from very very close range, uh, the Iranians are uh, are not going to put aside the goal of having their own uh, their own uh, whole card uh, against the U.S. invasion. Right. So that's just uh, that's just not going to happen. As far as the Syrians go, um, Syria. I think there would be an even bigger rebellion in Syria than there is now, except the Syrian public, having seen what happened in Iraq at close range, wants the Assad family out, but they're kind of worried and fearful about what might replace it. So you've, <laughs> yeah. so you've, got a, uh, you've got a situation. And don't think that even in a dictatorship, people don't feel that way. I mean, oh, they right. know that they they know that they live in a dictatorship. They know they hate the dictatorship, but they also look at their own society and see the potential for chaos. Especially if you live right next door to Lebanon, uh, which every Syrian does, and you know can basically see uh, what happens in a society when, at one particular point in time, the whistle blows and everyone starts shooting at each other for you know what they perceive to be really good reasons. Mm-hmm. And I say this because Lebanon was the the military intervention of my generation in the Marine Corps. So right. we were, you know, if you were a, if you were an East Coast Marine uh, in the 1980s, you were always intensely concerned with uh, with Lebanon. Yeah, yeah, I, and I'm I'm old enough to remember that. Um, I was a, a you know a, a teenager at the time, but um, I remember you know when when the bombing of the barracks happened and and all the the response to that um it was it was a pretty big deal uh well i don't know if i have any more questions for you bill i think that's pretty much i don't want to get into the other stuff we talked about the other day because i don't want to take up any more of your time but well i've really we uh, i've really thing. enjoyed it as a matter of fact those people who are you know who are interested with uh with our current sparring with uh with iran uh might want to check out uh uh, my novel, The Warriors of God, which has just been reissued in uh, in electronic book format, and uh, it sort of explores the consequences of what uh, uh, at first the low intensity conflict between the U.S. and Iran would look like, and uh, how it might uh, backlash onto our own borders uh, if uh, if it does take place. Mm-hmm. 
Where can people pick that book up at? Well, it's uh, currently available in in all electronic book formats, whether it's the Amazon Kindle and uh, or the the Barnes and Noble Nook or uh, your uh, your local iStore, you know, your local uh, iTunes uh, for uh, for your your iPhone or your iPad. Uh, you can check it out on my uh, on my website, which is WilliamChristieAuthor.com. Uh, Christie spelled C H R I S T I E. Uh, or just uh, search it uh, search it on Amazon, or uh, plug in William Christie author in uh, Google or Bing search block, and you'll be able to to pick it up. Because uh, uh, three of my earliest ones, uh, three of my earliest novels are are now available on electronic books, and uh, I think uh, and I've brought them up to date for uh, for the current uh, for the current readership and. As I said, the Warriors of God is uh, is about the conflict between U.S. and Iran, and Mercy Mission is sort of the unintended consequences of the war on drugs in Central America. And the Blood We Shed is about uh, a U.S. Marine Corps battalion uh, during 9/11. So I think uh, I think anyone interested in uh, in uh, a good thriller and uh, uh, national security might want to uh, might want to check them out. Yeah, your your books are always very uh, very interesting for a number of reasons, and it, for a lot of people, it's a different way to look at history. Um, appreciate your time, Bill. It's great to talk to you again, and I uh, look forward to uh, doing so again real soon. Doug, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Wake the Herd is a production of LansingandBeyond.com. Listen to all of our program archives and read our blogs, news, and commentary at LansingandBeyond.com.